Hello, and welcome to the California Community Media Exchange Show. This is a quarterly, issue-based show that gives voice to people in Northern California. From the rural corners of the Humboldt County to the city of San Francisco, and from the agricultural community of Gilroy to the surf-loving population of Santa Cruz and the many areas in between, we provide a well-rounded view of California communities in our region. I'm Erica Hager, a member of the Digital Arts Service Corps, which is dedicated to supporting community media and technology nationwide. I've been working to facilitate the inception and management of the California Community Media Exchange, a collaborative between seven different community media centers in the Greater Bay Area. The group's purpose is to share best practices and resources to sustainably impact community media's role in providing a voice to the public through access to media and technology. In this first episode, we introduce the community media centers that make up the California Community Media Exchange. Each center created a segment which addresses who they are and what they do. First, let's check out Access Monterey Peninsula, who just celebrated their 10-year anniversary. Back in uh, 1995, uh, uh, a gentleman who I like to call Papa Amp, uh, Fred Cohn, pulled together some focus groups, uh, various uh, community folks, and to find out whether or not the community would like to have access uh, television. And the answer was a definite yes. Actually broadcast on five channels. That shows up on three different channels depending on where you live. But we basically have channel 24, which is where the community can present their own programs. There's a lot of producers and, and they're all from the community. I call it television by the people, of the people, and for the people. We think it's been a wonderful success in terms of really showing the diversity and the range of talent and interest and passions and so forth, points of view that the community has. So we have three different flavors of Channel 25, all of which originate from here, and they're all local government, featuring uh, city council meetings and other types of government activities. Then channel 27 is our other channel, the fifth one, and uh, that is community messaging. We have a wonderful classical music service on uh, uh, right now, and we have uh, messages from local nonprofits. We have three kind of aspects of our mission, and uh, one of them is certainly the broadcast and presentation of materials that are on behalf of the community. Another one is the training. We train people in media skills and media literacy, which means how we understand and process media. That's very important, uh, particularly in the 21st century. And we're expanding that training quite a bit now to include more computer uh, literacy types of things as well. Uh, that's one of the things we're doing in the second decade is, one of our, uh, is our expanded uh, training offerings. But right now people can take classes in studio production, ready set production, uh, high definition camera production or basic camera production and digital editing. Those, that's our usual gamut of classes and we offer those every week. As a producer you come and try out ideas. You don't have to sell us on it, we'll say, that's a good idea. In many ways, I've always saw this in terms of a kind of a laboratory for the community, a place where they can cook up things and try them out and test them, and experiment, and see what flies in the community. Mm -hmm. And so we really, we really want people to have, have any kind of ideas you know, to share, come to us and we'll help you. If you think a laid-back surf city like Santa Cruz wouldn't have an active community television station, think again as you go along for a day in the life of a staff producer. 7.30. Need a good cup of coffee? Get me started. I also need a story. A good community story. What could it be? Where will I find it? Well, I could cover that lecture on poisonous mushrooms. Maybe something big will break at that government meeting. It's always the basketball game. Or maybe the county fair. Still, hey, that kid looks like he's got something good going on. Glad I always carry a camera. Back to the station, there's training to do.
There's Craig teaching one of our camera classes. There's Ron and Master Control running our government, education, and public access programs 24-7. Boss needs me. It's an emergency. Big story. World Series trophy? Well, I guess it's a giant story. Back at the station, it's showtime. At CTV, I can do it all. in the p.m. day's ending one more cup of coffee one more great community tv show now we're off to san francisco home of the Golden Gate Bridge, America's Gateway to the West, and to SF Commons, the public access television station in San Francisco, operated by a nonprofit organization called the Bay Area Video Coalition. We are at the Bay Area Video Coalition, or BAVAC, in San Francisco, California and BAVAC operates SF Commons, which is the public access TV station here. BAVAC is a really unique place because we deal with so many different types of people. It's a 35-year-old organization, but we're new to public access TV, so we just took over the public access TV station in San Francisco in September of 2009. For 35 years, we've been working with independent producers, with Silicon Valley tech companies, doing training for them, with young people. We have a pretty robust youth media program here. We work with teachers in schools and schools themselves. We work with nonprofit organizations. So what makes it unique is that a lot of times all those people are interacting here at the facility in different ways. One of the big challenges community media faces in California and here too is that a lot of the funding for public access used to come through franchise fees. So local governments used to be able to sort of negotiate on their own behalf to say, if you're going to use our public right of ways to deliver your services to consumers, you have to put back a little bit into the system that will support public access to the airwaves. So that's what's been going on for many decades of public access. Well, what happened in the state of California is that a statewide franchise law was passed called DIVCA, or the Digital Infrastructure Video and Competition Act. The funding went down by almost 80% uh, in one year. So it's really challenging to operate a public access TV station with such limited funds. So some of the stuff we're doing to overcome those challenges are basically innovating. We're trying to work more and more with nonprofit organizations. We're working in some of our diverse cultural centers that are around town. We developed a new website that will really support the community being participants in public access TV. So they can go to the library or one of these cultural centers to deliver their files to us and use our website to help promote their programs. We're also running a special program called the Neighborhood News Network, or N3. So using high-speed broadband connections to the cultural centers and Boys and Girls Club, we can work with a lot of diverse populations directly who can produce shows at their sites and then stream them over the air through us. So there are challenges, but we're, we're working to overcome them by both innovating and collaborating with other centers regionally. Making a difference is something that I think is done kind of person to person. So a lot of times people will say, well, why is community media still important 
if we have stuff like YouTube and it's free online, Facebook is free, you know, why, why are we important? Why do, why do we exist? Freedom of speech is an extremely important value that I think we share as Americans. And there's just fewer and fewer ways for people to participate in um, the commercial enterprises of media. So while there may be YouTube who has access to computers and training to be able to create their own shows, and a lot of times the only way people get that access is through public access TV stations and community media. So I think it's vitally important for our democracy. Does someone smell something? Garlic. Now we go to the garlic capital of the world, Gilroy, California, where the Community Media Access Partnership, or CMAP, is hard at work meeting the media and technology needs of Gilroy, Hollister, and San Juan Batista. CMAP has allowed me to create 11 uh, programs of my own, Flowers Made Simple, where I was able to instruct the world <laughs> on how to arrange flowers just for the fun of it. And everything was volunteer. They provided the, the staff, the studio, the instruction. They helped me kind of realize a dream of having my own TV series. And I couldn't have done it without CMAP. CMAP has continued to provide valuable local programming not found anywhere else, including an average of 13 government meetings each month, the Panetta Institute series, and school, nonprofit, and government agencies. CMAP is the only place that you can go for government access programming. There's no one else providing coverage of local government meetings, serves the community in a variety of ways. Mainly, government access provides a level of transparency in local government that citizens really demand and that they are owed. New shows coordinated by CMAP staff have created great value to the community, such as Going Green, Arts 101, Depth of Field, and hours of live coverage of the annual Gilroy Garlic Festival. CMAP is the true multimedia forum for our community. In the case of our Going Green show, CMAP serves as an outreach to promote awareness of sustainable business practice and technology in general. CMAP right now is giving Rancho San Houston a voice that we didn't really have in the community. It's putting the kids out in the community, bringing everything together letting the community know that we're here and also you know letting the students know that they actually can participate in election days and and creating many documentaries and things like that. CMAP's goal is to serve the media and technology communications needs of the community it serves. CMAP's operations team has implemented a new open source database and checkout reservation system rolled out a new TriCaster for mobile events and has outfitted local schools with cameras, laptops, video production equipment and mini studios. My involvement with CMAP has uh, strictly been in the educational realm and their help you know uh, in putting together this TV media class has been so vital. If it wasn't for their help I know that um, coming up with the curriculum to teach this class would have been a lot more difficult. They also come in and uh, share with not only the students but with myself as well knowledge, uh, technology, how you put together a story, how you put together a public service announcement. They've just really been involved. CMAP provides six weekly after-school programs to youth. This means CMAP now provides 21st century skills through media and technology tools to over 350 San Benito and Santa Clara County youth each year. CMAP staff has also built relationships with community partners to create media, provide trainings, and to support the work of hundreds of local nonprofit organizations in our community. Once a quarter, CMAP offered PSA days and member networking nights, providing opportunities for networking, for collaboration production, and to help nonprofits promote their work in the community. CMAP's active membership grew from 142 in 2008 to over 300 members in 2010. I like CMAP because it's full of a lot of people who are really fun to hang out with. Here at CMAP, I've learned lots of stuff, such as video production and editing. CMAP is proud of the recent growth 
expansion, and ability to serve our community's needs. Thank you for being part of CMAP's growth as an organization, committed to providing the public with media access, training, 21st century job skills, positive youth activities, critical local content, and a platform for self and community expression. Our next destination, Davis Media Access, is the only one in the collaborative to have a low power FM station as part of their community media center. Let's go check out what else you can do at Davis Media Access. Davis Media Access is a community resource where new ideas are born, nurtured, and brought to fruition, where young and old can work together, learning from one another. Everything is hands-on and the staff is incredibly friendly, patient, and actively works to help people develop skills. With the writing of a fairly simple and straightforward proposal, my daughter and I have access to the KDRT radio studio. Each week we produce a show by, for, and about homeschooling for our community. Now let's take a peek behind the Redwood Curtain to see what Eureka-based Community Media Center Access Humboldt is up to as the access provider for Humboldt County. For many people living in rural America, broadband provides a way to express themselves, to give them a voice. Here in the Northern Californian town of Eureka, Access Humboldt is doing just this. It's providing programming, it's providing training and support, and is even rolling out its own wireless network. Access Humboldt is a community media organization that was formed by the county of Humboldt and the cities in Humboldt County to manage essentially cable franchise resources, so channels, production facilities, and um, for public education and government purposes. It's like an electronic soapbox. It's a place that the community has a voice that's uncensored, and for the most part, unfiltered. And it's whatever the community voice, whatever the community wants to say, the community's voice is in, empowered through these channels. As a consumer of media content, I now look at the universe of media that's available, and I decide, oh, I want to look at this now. I don't schedule my day to go look for when is my program going to be available to me. I just go and find it, and I download it, and I look at it now on demand. So for us, that means really, the channels, the old way of, that used to be the, the key resource was a channel on a cable system, that's just one of our distribution outlets now. It's not the only one, and it may not be the most, it's still the most important one, but in the future it may not be. So do you see access to high-speed internet, broadband, and open internet as being a universal right for every citizen of the U.S.? In rural communities and remote communities like ours in Humboldt County in California, we find whole pockets that have virtually no access to the internet. Maybe a dial-up connection is the best connection they can get. So in that sense, making media available over broad, there is no broadband, there's narrowband internet access, not broadband, and so it's not that meaningful. This led our organization to go from, okay, we started with putting our content, making it available over the internet, now we have to help make the internet available, make broadband available. So we it really shifted the frame of our work from just media access to broadband access because if you don't have access to the mechanism, to the broadband connection, then you really don't have access to the content that's available through those connections. So we started developing community broadband deployments, wireless, uh, and uh, for example, we did a project in a little town that you may visit on your, uh, you'll pass through anyway, of Rio Dell. And, uh, where this town had very little access to the internet and we had through our 
cable franchise requirement. We had fiber deployment there to City Hall. So we did a wire, wireless, a Wi-Fi deployment where the City Hall, the library, the fire station, we created an internet, free internet access for the public there. And so folks in that community can go to the library or to the fire station. They can bring their laptop and sit in the parking lot, and then they get free access to the internet for that community. One of the things that we have found, uh, unfortunately, is the more that you do build it yourself, and in our case, uh, building it ourselves meant means um, partnering with private. We have private companies that want to see it happen, so they're so they're helping either with donations of equipment or cash or otherwise helping. We have public a agencies like a local government that wants to see it happen. A lot of times they have a hard time partnering directly because you have procurement laws and issues about the mechanisms of a public bureaucracy and a private enterprise working together. So the nonprofit, we're a nonprofit, so we sort of facilitate the partnering between private interests and public interests and design, we call them social enterprise model, where we take the incentive that the private sector has and the essential service sort of role that public agencies have and we put them together and design a, a process to build these things. So what we find, though, is, is we're under the radar from the private providers. What occurs is if we are too successful, the AT&Ts of the world, the large commercial providers, would say, you're taking business away from us. So even though they weren't providing the service and it wasn't economic for them to do it, they have gotten legislation in place that prevents public agencies from doing the service directly. We actually had a law in California that, did, that um, prohibited a local government from providing wire, internet access to their residents. And it was written by industry basically to prevent us from doing it for ourselves. So we sort of have to involve ourselves in policy just to even protect our ability to do our own thing. We're ready to do things with our own resources, and we had to basically get protection to keep private um, industry from hobbling us. And you see this across the country. There are, there's state legislation that prohibits a city from providing broadband service. Why? And the, the rationale that the industry provides is, well, because it's unfair competition, unfair to have the public government competing with the private sector. And the, and the local government says, but you weren't serving our community to begin with. We're, we're not competing with you because you decided not to serve us. Or you serve us at such a low quality of service or at such a high price that there's no uptake because it's really the access and to broadband is a, is a combination of factors. It's basic access, having it available, and then affordability is a factor. Industry is so invested in lobbying and influencing legislation and regulation that we really have to figure out how to overcome the sort of disproportionate influence of private profit incentives in a sphere that really is about fundamentally how we are informed, how we understand. And if that's now, if the marketplace of ideas is only private marketplace, then we're missing out on some very important uh, parts of who we are as human beings and what we need to, what our quality of life is going to look like. The Community Media Center of Marin, located in San Rafael, is the youngest center in the collaborative, having launched its channels in June 2009, but is quickly becoming a vital part of the community. I was first introduced to CMCM through uh, the media committee of the League of Women Voters. I came down here really at first when Michael Eisenmeier was hired because he brought an Anycast, a little multi-camera switching unit. And I think it's just vital that we're able to go out into the community and do events. The television, uh, uh, Community television doesn't always happen in the studio here. It happens out in the real world. I first found out about the CMCM through my college and classes. Um, people were talking about them and said this was a good resource, so I checked it out, came down. I uh, went to the orientation, and ever since then, 
I'm really impressed with the classes that are offered here. The, uh, I mean, everything from studio production to location, multiple camera production to single camera field production to Final Cut Pro editing, and there's even some workshops in, in write, script writing and a number of different things that are specific clinics to help people improve their skills. I use the Media Center right now for a variety of different projects. Um, I, I do some stuff for the Marin Women's Hall of Fame, I've got some interview shows here. I do a project, some projects for the League of Women Voters. Here, if you have an idea, you can grab a camera, you can, you can go out and shoot, or you can come in the studio and shoot, or you can go out to any cast, you can back in and post it on Final Cut Pro, and you can get on the air without going through tons and tons of obstacles. It really makes the, the time between a concept that's in your mind and the reality that's on the screen very short, and that's exciting. The Media Center for me not only is allowing me the opportunity to meet some great people, but to really reach out and explore my artistic side. We're creating uh, shorts, video shorts, as well as full-length features. Uh, one of them is the water issue here in Marin County and where we're going to go with it. It's not really politically bent, but it's just a way for the community to open their eyes and really see what our options are in the future. We have a beautiful facility that's up to speed with the latest equipment, and I think it gives everyone in the community an opportunity to be an artist and to really um, have the video equipment to tell their story. I mainly use the media center for the cameras and the editing stations. Uh, I'm putting together a skate documentary, so I don't need studio time a lot, so I'm allowed to just come in here and get what I need and then get on the go. The Media Center is important in my life because I'm here every day, if not every other day. Um, I come down a lot, check out cameras at least once a week. I'm on the computers, editing. Um, I'm also interning here, so it's a great opportunity for me to learn. I work upstairs with Sam Long. Um, he's teaching me a lot just about how the whole operation works, how to get hands on. Um, and so it's really just a major learning experience for me. projects with other people, talk to other people, um, discuss what techniques you can use, what not to use, um, and it's fun to just hang out down here, really. I'd say walk through the doors and come to one of the orientations. You'll see that just for a few dollars, the opportunity that you have, it will expand your horizons and give you the skill level to, to do anything you want. It's really one of my, my communities now. It's one of the, the few communities in several parts of, of my life. I enjoy the people here, I enjoy the interaction of the young people and the older folks that have been around and the enthusiasm and the creativity and it really has become a part of part of what I do with really young these days. Thanks for joining us on this tour of the community media centers that make up the California Community Media Exchange. To find out more about the group, check out www.communitymediaexchange.org. If you'd like to get involved in the community media movement and show your support, go to the Alliance for Community Media website at www.alliancecm.org or visit your local community media center. I'm Erica Hager with the California Community Media Exchange. Thanks for tuning in.